Pokemon at this point is so far expanding in every direction that it needs its own Dewey Decimal system. With Pokemon on every aspect from the cards to the show and of course the games are all things I am very much into. I wanted to spend time this year across both of my channels looking through the history of Pokemon, so expect several Pokemon videos covering major aspects of the gaming side of things over here. It wouldn't hurt you to subscribe. Today we are going over a bunch of the spin-off games from the Pokemon franchise. A lot of the one-off games that are as equally really cool as some of them are pretty weird, but we like weird, so that's okay. Now, I split this between major spin-offs and spin-off series to these more standalone spin-offs. For example, games like Pokemon Coliseum, Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, the Ranger series, the Mystery Dungeon series, the Poke Park games, and the Rumble series, they will all not be included in this video, but will have their own videos throughout this year since they are a bit bigger to cover on their own, as well as stuff on mobile like Pokemon Go, Pokemon Masters, Magikarp Jump, etc. Unless they have been ported and placed on a console, I won't be looking at them here in this video. And of course, arcade games. Unlike Pokémon Tournament, there are a few arcade machine only games that just won't be included here today. But what that leaves us with is a large assortment of games across every generation of gaming, from consoles to handhelds, weird devices, and of course, the personal computer. We have a lot to go through today, so let's just get on with our journey through the weird world of Pokémon spin-off games. Oh, wow. I look at the list in front of me and I stand here in awe of how many really cool and interesting spin-offs Pokemon had, and really stun-locked on where to start. So let's just start with a fun one on a console that led the path forward for these spin-off games. That's right, dust off your Nintendo 64, let's first look into Hey You, Pikachu. Hey You Pikachu is a fun one to start off with because it's just such a weird and cool concept. With the popularity of the show and every kid wanting their own Pikachu like Ash had, why not have a game that comes with a wonky microphone to speak to a digital Pikachu? I remember the commercials for this one being pretty funny, in fact, I even own this advertisement loop that would play in stores for it. That's how much I loved how this game was marketed. Maybe that makes me weird, but regardless, the game allows you to communicate with your own Pikachu that Professor Oak places in your care, as he has you use this new device, the Pokey Helper, which is just the microphone. So from here, the game has these ups and downs, and I mean that emotionally. For the main part, the gameplay is speaking with Pikachu to complete a bunch of different tasks on different days, whether the day consists of learning, playing, or discovering. From all of this and the points that you earn, you can get new items for Pikachu to interact with. So emotionally, you build this connection with Pikachu. It feels like you have this real bond with a totally virtual creature. But after the recent Research is done, which is a year's worth of in-game days, you are forced to then release Pikachu back into the wild as if you're in that episode where Ash almost leaves Pikachu in the woods to be with all the other Pikachu. And it's all way too emotional, I should be crying at it still, and now I have to do it with a Pikachu that I've spent day after day taking care of on a deep spiritual level, and you have to keep saying goodbye into the microphone until he understands that you're ditching him there. But after the credits, Pikachu is back as if it never happened, as you cope with this all through your memories with him. Yeah, thanks for that game. Really appreciate the trauma. I wouldn't say that this is a great game as the gameplay loop is fairly slow and it's just you talking into a microphone hoping Pikachu would understand you correctly and not just look at you like you're some sort of idiot, but it was a really cool idea and a fun use of the technology at the time. It has more positive memories attached to it than not and it has this 90s level of charm to it and for that, it's valid. Pokemon! Pokemon Stadium! Now let's look at Pokemon Snap, probably the most memorable for so many people as who didn't play this game, whether at home or on the Pokemon Snap stations at Blockbusters, which in fact I for some reason now own one. But this game's a chilled out certified classic. You take the role of Todd Snap, a character that also appeared in the anime who would now also be the main character in this game and later in the game's sequel as a side character. Here Professor Oak has you go out on these on-rail journeys throughout different areas in the Pokemon world to capture photos 
as a Pokemon in their natural habitats as they interact with the environment, with each other, and with some of the player's manipulation to feed them or cause certain events to happen. After you take all of the photos throughout the area, Professor Oak rates them on how good they are. It was a pretty easy gameplay loop and it was fun to sit back and find out all of the ways that you could just manipulate the levels to get cooler photos of the different Pokemon. The better the photos, the better the ratings, which stuff like the Pokemon being framed nicely, the size of the Pokemon itself, and special poses or moments would all equal up to that and just be pretty cool to capture. The more you play, the more you unlock to help you get more new and creative ways to capture photos of these Pokemon. As I mentioned, a cooler aspect of the game was the Blockbuster Snap Station that you could go and visit with your personal cartridge of the game. And as long as you had one of these Snap Station cards with a loaded credit on it, you can print photos directly from it onto these little stickers. You could also play the demo of the game on the machine, but mainly you would go to one of these to print out photos. I also got the machine to print photos from any game that I want, and even at one point for the sequel game on the Switch, got it to print photos from that game as well. Sometimes I just have too much time on my hands. So just to bring this up briefly, the Pokemon Stadium that we got in the US was actually the second Pokemon Stadium game. In Japan, they first had Pocket Monster Stadium, which in comparison is like what Stadium 1 would be, but it would be a slimmed down version of it, only having 42 of the original 151 Pokemon for you to battle with. This was at the time where the Nintendo 64 was having a disc-based add-on for the system being made. But when the N64 DD didn't end up becoming a fully realized thing, failing pretty quickly, only having 10 games made for it on top of being something that would never leave Japan, the game was then just shifted to a regular release on the Nintendo 64 in Japan. This game would be compatible to connect to a Game Boy via the N64 transfer pack, but then we would eventually get to the first real stadium game, Pokemon Stadium, where now we start to get the full picture of this game's potential. With this game, and for what the Stadium series is in general, is a way for you to take the battles of the Pokemon from your Game Boy and play them in a more detailed way with full 3D models on a console instead of the handheld. At the time, this was revolutionary, to be able to see these battles the way your brain thinks they are on a Game Boy screen, now just on a TV screen. It was so cool, the amount of times I would just be over at a friend's house or they'd be over at my house and we would just load up the game and battle was just awesome. The game itself doesn't have a real story to follow or complete, but it gives you battles to compete in to beat different tournament challenges. Gym Leader Castle is where you face off against the original Gym Leaders and the Elite Four, as well as the Champion, and then after everything is done, you get to face off in a special battle with Mewtwo, which is great, until you realize that after this, you unlock doing that all over again with Harder AI. However, like I said, the game in general was just so cool. Seeing the detail and the attacks that each Pokemon would have, all backed by the hype of an announcer, to make it really feel like you were in this Pokemon. Pokemon battle. You can either play with the rental Pokemon that the game can offer you, or if you had your Game Boy games and the N64 transfer pack, you can use your own party of Pokemon from the Game Boy games. And this is how you would also be able to unlock Surfing Pikachu. While the Surf special move that was taught to this certain Pikachu if you use Pikachu in your battle party and defeat the Master Ball division within the game. While this Pikachu can be from any of the Pokemon games at the time, if that Pikachu goes to the yellow version of the game, you get access to a special Surfing Pikachu minigame in Pokemon Pokemon Yellow, which is pretty cool honestly. While there were other Pokemon to get as rewards, Surfing Pikachu was pretty incredible at the time. Now, besides the battles, these games were remembered for another thing, and that is the mini games that you could play. Clefairy Says, which is just Simon Says, but you have to repeat back the directions being shown to you. Sushi Go Round, where as Lickitung you must consume the most amount of food without eating or inhaling certain items. Dig Dig Dig, is who can dig through the ground faster as Sand True to hit water first. Snore War places you as a drowsy that must at the right time cast Hypnosis to make the other Drowsy fall asleep before he does it to you. Thundering Dynamo as either a Voltorb or Pikachu, you have to hit back and forth the A and B buttons to match the electricity to the right color of the light bulb. Magikarp Splash is all about having him hit the counter properly to earn the most points. Ekans Hoop Hurl is like Ring Toss where you throw Ekans over Diglets popping out of the ground. Rock Harden is the classic Metapod v Metapod anime matchup, but instead you could be Metapod versus Kakuna as you constantly use the move Harden to 
to defend yourself from falling boulders, trying to take minimal damage while managing the stamina output. And finally, Run Rattata Run, where you play as Rattata, who is on a treadmill leaping over obstacles that come your way as you try to make it to the goal line first. These minigames really made this game so much more special, as it was equally as fun battling as it was facing your friends in these minigames. At Blockbusters, you can go visit those snap stations for a special bonus for the stadium game, which was a nice repurpose for those machines themselves. Pokemon and Nintendo were really hyping up this game's release, where they even had this giant bundle version that came with the console itself, two controllers with one of them being the atomic purple color, the game itself, a trainer's journal, a poster, and of course, the coolest of cool Pokemon cards from back in the day, a cool Porygon Black Star promo card, which is all just pretty incredible. But you know, where do we go from here? Yeah, that's right, you make a sequel, or if you're in Japan, a third game. So we've entered the second generation of Pokemon at this point for the game to release, where on the cover of Pokemon Stadium 2 is none other than Ho-Oh and Lugia, that would also come with the gold and silver looking cartridge for the N64 that truly makes it stand out in any collection. Basically, it was more of the same if you played Stadium, you knew exactly what you were getting here. You also compete in different cups, as well as go through the next eight gym leaders, Elite Four, and then your rival at the end, which unlocks a harder mode, as well as everything from the first game, the original eight gym leaders, Elite for and the champion. Now, in addition to the previous Pokemon, we have access to Generation 2's Pokemon for battle, which now the transfer pack is compatible with gold, silver, and crystal to gain access to your parties of the newer Pokemon in those games. You also get the Game Boy Tower, allowing you to play the handheld mainline Pokemon games on the N64, which was pretty awesome. For the newer generation handheld Pokemon games, you could connect them to the mystery gift feature for in-game items and in-game decorations, which just adds so much more in value of what you can do here. Because on top of all that, yeah, they're back! Mini games! Gutsy Golbat, where you play as Golbats flying around trying to avoid your opponents and Magnemites that are in your way from collecting hearts given from Jinx. Streaming Stampede, where you test your memory and counting of certain Pokemon as they go by as either Cluffa or Igglybuff. Pichu's Power Plant, as you build up a full charge of electricity from electrodes. Tumbling Togepi, much like the last game's run, Rattata Run, has Togepi on a treadmill, now avoiding obstacles and reaching the goal line. Eager Eevees has Eevee's trying to collect the proper fruit displayed without running into Pineco. Barrier Ball is deflecting a Pokeball back and forth as Mr. Mime. Burrix Frolic has you collect Pokeballs into your corner to win. Deliverous Delivery is collecting the most presents and earning the best score from doing so. Egg Emergency is all about saving falling eggs as a chancy, but not catching any falling Voltorb. Topsy Turvy has you play as Hitmontop in a Beyblade style battle of knocking the other opponent out of the arena. Rampage Rollout is a race among Donphan that you need to clear the laps while trying to stop your opponents as they try to do the same thing to you, and Clear Cut Challenge has you play as either Pinsir, Scyther, or Scizor, where you have to do your best at cutting logs at the right point, and the person with the most points from getting the best cuts wins. Yeah, the game was jam-packed with stuff to do, and it was a nice upgrade from the previous Stadium game that offered all of these new Pokemon, more detailed animations, and just the most complete experience yet for a Pokemon battling game off of the handheld device. But there's one more Pokemon game on the Nintendo 64 that I need to bring up. This was the Pokemon game on the N64 that I played the most as a kid. I love this game so much. Based on Panel de Pan, which was later turned into Tetris Attack and released on the SNES, Pokemon Puzzle League is essentially the same game, but with a full-on theme of Pokemon, and even better, the theme of the anime side of Pokemon, meaning Ash Ketchum was front and center on the box art, and the characters from the show make appearances in the game along with their voice actors. While the game offers the standard 2D mode of this style of game, where it feels just like the game it's based off of, the 3D mode really steps things up, giving you a cylindrical playing field to rotate around to play the game. And to play it, you have to clear out blocks by matching them in groups of three or more, either vertically or horizontally. As the bottom of the grid pushes up new rows, so while you're rushing to clear out blocks, more are constantly coming in. Luckily, there are ways to slow this down with chaining multiple block clusters and doing some nice comboing, and in a battle against another person, this can aid in hurting them with these bad blocks that make it even harder for them to play. But they can also do the same to you. The story that goes along with the challenges here follows Ash and Pikachu going on vacation sometime after the Orange Islands arc for the second season of the anime. But Professor Oak hits you up and says that Ash is selected to be a part of the official Puzzle League tournament, and Ash can never turn down a challenge, so now he must battle using blocks to face off against foes like Gary, uh, Tracy, who's not really a foe, he's just a friend, the Kanto gym leaders, Team Rocket, and of course, the big baddie himself, Giovanni. Where then after you get to fight the Elite Four, 
4, and of course, the Puzzle League Champion, who you've already defeated before, it's Gary. H how is he the champion? Weird. But after you take care of him again, you get to face off against Mewtwo for the Puzzle League Master Trophy, which is pretty cool. I like fighting against Mewtwo in these games. In total, there are 16 playable characters to choose from to represent you in battle, where a lot of the more interesting characters can be found in the two-player mode. Plus, the game uses a bunch of music from the anime that is fun to bump through the N64. It's not that much of a deep game, but it was so much fun. The amount of hours as a child that I poured into this game were beyond ridiculous. But this game would live on beyond this on the next platform we move on to now, since we have completed all the games on the N64, the Game Boy Color, and the Game Boy Advance era. Special Pikachu Edition N64 at participating retailers. Legion of Pokemon say you can! New Pokemon Puzzle League rated E for everyone. Similar to Puzzle League, Pokemon Puzzle Challenge offers a handheld experience of the game now, featuring Generation 2 Pokemon as you essentially play the same block-related gameplay minus the 3D parts to it as you face off against the gym leaders in Elite Four as well as collect Pokemon on your team for defeating certain challenges or hatching eggs. It did have a multiplayer mode that allows you to link up with friends and battle them, but honestly, it was really just a smaller version of the N64 game, but simple enough to pick up and play that it was still a lot of fun to do with friends. Plus, we have Generation 2 Pokemon here, so what could be better than that on the go? If you like the N64 game, you're probably gonna like the handheld version of it. This one is in the conversation again, as while I was making this video, Nintendo showed off that the Pokemon trading card game is releasing on their online service, which is really cool to see, regardless of how outdated the way you play in the game is compared to the current card game. But if you didn't have this game at the time, who even were you? Pokemon was dominating the collectible card market as well as the competitive side. So in order to bring more awareness to it, help teach others how to play the game and get people into buying the actual cards, this Game Boy game came to be. And it even came with this Black Star promo Meowth card, which I always love free cards. Just wait until I talk about Yu-Gi-Oh games. The game itself offers a little more than you may expect, as you take control of Mark, a person in hopes of becoming the greatest player at the Pokemon TCG, where Dr. Mason offers you some starting decks, where you get to choose a starter, basically, the Bulbasaur deck, the Charmander deck, or the Squirtle deck, and now you must face off against other typing-related clubs of TCG players to earn a medal from each of them. And once you take out each and every club for the eight corresponding types, you are able Able to battle the Grand Masters at the game and go after earning their legendary cards featuring the bird trio of Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, and then even a Dragonite. Along the way, you are also able to build and morph your deck and battle strategies from the clubs that you defeat, which gives you a more intricate experience in learning the game. You can also win some other cards from your rival in the game that you will face on occasion, and after the Grand Masters are defeated, you'll be able to face him again, only this time he has all of those same powerful, super legendary cards as well. The game the game also wanting to focus on the trading part of the hobby gives you the ability to trade cards with the various people in the lounges and even get access to some pretty weird and infamous cards from people like Imakune, a Japanese musician who has a long legacy with Pokemon, from being involved in the music side of things for the anime, responsible for some game work, and even the author of one of the Pokemon Tales picture books. Oh, and uh, drawing and or being on a Pokemon card. He's just a weird dude and we love him for that. Also, Mr. Ishihara, the CEO of the Pokemon company, is in the game dealing with the flying Pikachu and surfing Pikachu cards. Additionally, the game offers you to link up with another player and either battle one another or even trade. There was even this card pop feature that allows you to use the IR feature that the Game Boy Color had built in, which had both people with each their own copy of the game generate a random card in their game for each other. This could only be done once and you have to find a new person who has their own copy to do it again, which this was the only way to get a hold of the Phantom cards, which could either be a Mew card Card or a Venusaur card. Funny enough, the guidebook for this game was how you were able to get the Black Star promo card featuring Venusaur. But we never got the sequel to this game here in the States. Pokemon card GB2 Team Great Battle is here. Wow, what a name. This game would actually be a sequel to the first game from a story standpoint, but giving you the option, just like in Pokemon Crystal, to play as a boy or a girl in the game. Either you can play as Mark once more, or you can play as Mint, which that is just a great name. Here now, Team Rocket comes to cause chaos by stealing Pokemon cards, leaving you with Dr. Mason once more with whatever cards he could help save left for you, adding into the excuse of not having the cards you had before in the last game. To progress 
progress in the game, you must face all four Great Rocket members to assemble a coin back together to gain access to Great Rocket Island to defeat them once and for all. While there are definite improvements to the game overall, you're mostly getting the same game here. But with some new cards that are put into the game and that card pop feature returning offering two more extremely hard to get phantom cards. This time with Here Comes Team Rocket and surprisingly, Lugia. So hey, yeah, that's pretty cool. But sadly, we never got this game here in the States and that's a shame. So I guess we'll just move on. Pokemon Pinball is extra memorable to me as I remember my dad coming home one day with it as a surprise, and I've never been more excited for anything in my entire life. And when you look at this cartridge for it, you can't ever forget that battery that needed to be there. It was for the rumble features that the game had, which I thought was pretty neat. But what else can I say? I enjoy a good game of pinball. I enjoy Pokemon. This is just those things put together. The big goal here is actually capturing the original 151 as you play on either the red table or the blue table with different locations that give you a chance to start a catch mode where you have to hit these bumpers six times to be able to capture the Pokemon that appears, which takes hitting it four times to do so, all while having a limited window to do that. So you can see how collecting them all may be a difficult task. For evolution mode, you can take a Pokemon you've already captured from that session you are currently playing and send it to the table and try to hit it at all the right targets that unlock these certain items needed for you to enter the hole in the center of the board to evolve the Pokemon. Pretty simple to understand the gameplay loop, but it does offer a lot of challenge and some annoyances because because it is pinball, and not everyone is a pinball master. I know I wasn't as a kid, and even as an adult, eh, no shot, but it was still a lot of fun to play and offered endless amounts of gameplay to even attempt capturing all of the Pokemon in the game. Luckily, it did end up getting a sequel on the Game Boy Advance called Pokemon Pinball Ruby and Sapphire. This game was like the last game, but if the game went to the gym and buffed up a whole lot. Now featuring Pokemon from generation 1, 2, and 3, the game had so much to do, fully being in detailed color and offering just a whole ton more. Just like the last game, you get two boards, the Ruby board or the Sapphire board, and you mainly do the same things. It's just more pinball. I do, however, like that if you mess up the timing with your flippers in the game, that sometimes Latios or Latias just swoops in to save it for you, which is delightful. The catching and evolution methods have changed slightly, but they boil down to similar gameplay, hitting things a certain amount of times to reveal the Pokemon, and for evolving you hit the three letters, spelling out Evo, and then go and collect the three items necessary for the evolution. Aside from the main two boards, there are bonus boards within the game that allow you to go and try and capture tougher, rarer, and more interesting Pokemon, like the three main legendaries from Generation 3, as well as Dusclops, Kecleon, and Celio. The game is extremely fun, and as a sequel to the previous game, it excels at enhancing the gameplay a bit, adding more to do and a visual treat for the Game Boy Advance. But now, after that, let's jump over to the GameCube real quick. What the heck is Pokemon Channel is what all the kids across the world were saying when they first heard about this Pokemon spin-off game. Once again, you are asked by Professor Oak to do something. Here you and your Pokemon sit in front of a TV. How meta. This game honestly already feels like a spiritual successor to Hey You Pikachu, where it has both aspects of a simulator and a virtual pet game. Oh, it's made by the same developers. Makes sense. You can either sit in front of the TV and look at the different channels that will be a part of the network that Professor Oak is making for whatever reason. I don't know, the man gone Hollywood. You are just the tester, making sure that the programs are all good for the trainers and the Pokemon watching, but it isn't just watching and giving the thumbs up on the programs. In fact, you can also explore beyond the TV, seeing the rest of your room, as well as various outside areas to go and play in for the, uh, the, the gameplay somewhat. Each day that goes by in real life is a full day in the game, and certain things happen during different times of the day and the days of the week. Overall, the different channels you can tune in for are Odd One Out, where Oddish come out, and you can make a a guess as to whether there will be an even or odd amount of them on screen, PNF or Pokemon News Flash where a Psyduck reports on the news and a Meowth will report live from any scene he's needed, Quiz Wobbuffet which is a quiz show that you are able to participate in somewhat, Smoochum Shape Up which is an exercise slash dance channel, Mareep Farm where you count Mareep as they just jump over a fence and try to put you to sleep, Chum Chum Ranking has Smoochum working on this channel too regarding ranking things like a gosh darn tier list video, Chansey's Fortune Cookie where you just pick one of them for your daily 
Fortune, Shop and Squirtle, which is like the Pokemon Channel equivalent of QVC, but the things you can buy actually show up in the game, from decorations for your room, to mini games, to other collectibles. Delibird will drop by the following day with whatever you purchased. Smeargle's Art Study, where he'll be able to rate pictures hanging on your wall in the room. Examination Hatch Up, where you can just watch an egg until it hatches. It's like watching paint dry, but at some point within 24 hours, the egg will hatch, and you can even bet on what Pokemon will be hatching. Slowpoke's weather report is him giving the weather, which can alter the weather outside. Then you have Professor Oak report, where you can just save the game there. And then there's the Pichu Brothers, where a special five-part special can be unlocked over the course of the week, and can be viewed in full later on. Also, Meowth's Party can be viewed, and it sure is something. It's really giving me those Beckett Pokemon Magazine cover vibes here. But at least it rocks. But even something magical happens when you eventually get gifted a star projector, where you, Pikachu, and now Jirachi watch the Pichu Brothers episode and Meow's party in the sky. How adorable. But the distribution event for the level 5 Jirachi didn't come to the States with Pokemon Channel. Instead, we got it with this disc for Pokemon Coliseum. But that's for a different video now, I guess. Oh, and speaking of those mini games, you could play some versions of the original Pokemon Mini Devices mini games through purchasing them at the Shop and Squirtle station. Plus, it even included a new one just for this game called Snorlax's Lunchtime. But I will speak on the other Pokemon mini games later on in this video. It also had the ability to work with the Nintendo e-reader, which I will have a video on by itself sometime soon, but the game came with some e-reader cards that would unlock base templates for you to paint on for Smeargle to react to and rate. But after this, for the GameCube, we also had Pokemon Box. So what is Pokemon Box? What makes it so special? Basically just an expanded upon storage unit for your Pokemon, a way to house them outside of Ruby and Sapphire. This is a concept we would see many times over from Pokemon later in more digital ways like Pokemon Bank and Pokemon Home. When it comes to the storage features in Pokemon Box, it sure lives up to its name. There sure are boxes and you sure can store Pokemon in them. So outside of that, What's the point in this? Well, you can also make stages in the showcase mode where you choose a landscape and place these signs with the images of Pokemon on them over the spots available. It's a feature that can sometimes come out looking pretty cool in efforts to display all of your Pokemon, but there really is no point to this. In fact, you can even place the same Pokemon plaque over and over again for the reasons of why not? Luckily, there was a pretty cool, albeit a little extreme at parts, extra for those who use the storage features. Bonus eggs. Bonus eggs would be the incentive to fill up the 25 boxes the game has. Now, when you start off, you can see it is pretty straightforward and easy to hit the numbers required in the storage to unlock these bonus eggs. You'll receive the first egg simply by playing the game. Well, just turning it on and using the storage features. This egg will hatch into a level five Swablu that immediately knows false swipe. The next egg you would receive for storing your first 100 Pokemon and would be a level five Zigzagoon that knows extreme speed. From here, things would start to get a bit trickier if you want the final two eggs. For the third egg, you need to deposit 500 Pokemon in total, which would grant you a level five Skitty that knows Payday. But 500 is a pretty big number, with Ruby and Sapphire only offering a total of 386 Pokemon. I say only for the comparison of needing 500 Pokemon to obtain the egg so you'll be needing plenty of doubles of Pokemon in order to hit that limit. But for the last egg, you'll need to have the will of a true Pokemon master to get the fourth and final egg, which hatches into a level five Pichu that funny enough knows Surf. You'll need to max out the complete storage capabilities of every box. So with 25 boxes that can hold 60 Pokemon each, you'll need to fill them up with a total of 1,499 Pokemon. That final 1,500th slot would be reserved for the Pichu egg. Now, that Pichu is really cool and can feel rewarding to unlock it, but it's going to take you some time as Pokemon games back then weren't as Pokemon catching happy as they may feel now. So be prepared to play for quite some time to accomplish this. But there has to be something here, right? This can't just be a storage unit, right? Well, on the main menu, menu screen you do have a second option, and that being you can connect your Game Boy Advance like you would for the storage, but now it essentially emulates your Ruby or Sapphire game through the GameCube and onto your TV. And back then, it was the cheapest way to do so instead of purchasing the Game Boy Advance player add-on. But the problem with this is that it can only play Ruby and Sapphire. No other games or even any future Pokemon games that would come next like Fire Red and Leaf Green or Emerald version. The Game Boy Advance player would let you play any game, 
including Ruby and Sapphire. In both ways, it makes sense, but also makes you question why these limitations. However, you could use Emerald, Fire Red, and Leaf Green to aid in your storage of Pokemon. Those other three games can all connect to Pokemon Box for the storage features only, but not as a way to play the games. It does play well with the game itself, and even giving you an option to take some screenshots, but outside of that, you'd probably rather use the Game Boy Advance player since it can play anything. But to go even further into Pokemon Box, feel free to check out my other video here on the channel where I went really deep into what it was all about. For now though, let's head over to the Nintendo DS. I swear, nothing can really beat the excitement I had for Pokemon Dash when it was coming out. I mean, the Nintendo DS was already pretty hype as it is, and you're telling me we're getting a Pokemon game on it already? Sign me up. The game, however, would be a rather odd game for the franchise as Pokemon Dash would be released where you, as Pikachu, race against other Pokemon from the first three generations, and Munchlax, in an all-out adventure and search for the finish. From just sliding your stylus on the touchscreen to run, to using a hot air balloon to travel, to falling from the sky with some balloons. The game was really weird, and I for some reason really liked it. I know, controversial. You see the gameplay from this top-down perspective, so you really don't see what's in front of you. You just have to kind of use where you are generally being guided to to figure out where the checkpoints are and where to go. There are different terrains to race through and power-ups to find along the way to help you make it through it all. And what was really cool is if you had any of the Game Boy Advance Pokemon games like Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, Fire Red, or Leaf Green, you were able to have them in the GBA slot on the DS and play some races on Dash on courses shaped like Pokemon from your party in those games. Like I said, this game was weird, but in all the best ways possible. Ah, that that's why. It was developed by the same people behind Hey You Pikachu and Pokemon Channel. It all makes sense now. Pokemon Troze was a game that I feel I never got into as much as I would have liked to, but always believed it had a really nice aesthetic. At the end of the day, if I loved the puzzle-like Pokemon games, why didn't I get into this one? It's essentially in the same genre, where you move around these blocks that are shaped like Pokemon, matching them with the touchscreen on the DS. Here though, you have to match four of a kind to earn points to have them removed from the screen. But you also get a Troze chance to very quickly earn more points being allowed to briefly hit some match threes. There is a story here as well, focusing on the Phobos Battalion, who have stolen a lot of Pokeballs for something secret, and it really feels like an early sun and moon thing here as the bad guys are represented by a Lunatone. And the good guys here, the Secret Operation League, or the Soul, are represented by a Soul Rock. That doesn't really mean anything, I just think it's neat. I also think that the game itself is pretty fun. I can see the appeal of it, and I probably would have really liked it at the time if I gave it more attention than I did. But Troze is just another fun take on the block matching genre. Pokemon Conquest may be the most underappreciated and most overlooked Pokemon spinoff, nay, Pokemon game in general. It is such a refreshing sight to see the concept of Pokemon being used and fused into something else to create a brand new game overall, putting together the Pokemon franchise with the Nobunaga's Ambition franchise. So thanks to Koei Tecmo, we get this new style turn-based strategy RPG for Pokemon with this very stylized coat of paint with the Nobunaga look. I mean, look at these characters and their matching Pokemon. This is matching your outfit to your Pokemon and I am here for it. Thanks to Mr. Ishihara for being a fan of the Nobunaga series, I guess when you're the CEO of Pokemon, you can make any of your wildest dreams come true. He ended up making a deal with the president over at Koei, who felt the same feelings but towards Pokemon, and yeah, it's that simple. The gameplay has you play with up to a full party size of six Pokemon going up against your opponent as you take turns moving across the battle area where you'll have the option to fight the opposing Pokemon as you run into them, defeat the other Pokemon, grow the links between you and your Pokemon, and take down down and conquer other kingdoms, going around to all 17 of them to unify the whole region. You can also still catch Pokemon in the game, but in doing so, it's through a button press timing game, which is pretty fun. So at its core, it's still very much a Pokemon game, but adding in the base elements of what made the Nobunaga series. The warriors themselves can add a bit of flair to the battles too, having specials that can help out in a match, but just look at their designs. They're just so cool. I know I've already said that basically, but I mean, come on, it's great. As you advance along in the game, have more kingdoms to oversee the operation operations of and you start getting overwhelmed, you start realizing that this game is really stuffed with things to do. You can feel how much work went into this game. This new region, the Ransai region, is a pretty unique one. Aside from having a completely separate aesthetic from what we've seen in Pokemon before, the region itself is literally shaped like Arceus. This plays into the whole story regarding uniting the 17 kingdoms and the being who created it all coming back. But after you finally beat the main story of the game, which is pretty lengthy on its own and gets really exciting dealing with 
with a certain Pokemon and the main opposing warlord of the game, Nobunaga, the game truly isn't over. You see, this whole campaign was just a little teaser, merely an appetizer for the rest of the game. Once completed, you unlock stories, which go on and give more campaigns throughout different areas of the region with all of the warlords around. That means there are 37 other campaigns to play through that can vary in length, with some being equivalent to the main original campaign story length. This is insane. I have never seen such an amount of endgame content that makes the campaign feel like it was just really nothing, regardless of how important and exciting that story was. Because the real ending to the story, where everything finally makes sense, doesn't even happen until you've fully done everything else in the game. And honestly, this game really deserves its own video to fully appreciate and break down all that it is. But for now, it is an incredible game, and I hope that one day it does get a sequel, but if not, there's enough content here to keep you busy for just quite some time. Something I've been doing a lot of recently is typing. These scripts don't write themselves. But if I needed a refresher, I have Pokemon to help me with that. Thanks to Learn with Pokemon Typing Adventure, complete with the Nintendo wireless keyboard. You play through these courses as you type out Pokemon names to capture them. With over 400 Pokemon to catch in the game, there's plenty of typing to do and plenty of names to learn how to spell properly. But for whatever reason, this educational game was never released in the States, coming out first in Japan and then later on in both Europe and Australia, but never the US. What was cool about this game is that it can help younger audiences learn to type, but also help challenge those more experienced and older. It's a cool little game that really goes to show you that if you add Pokemon to literally anything, people are going to flock to it. Just like this. Why do I even own this? Ah, it's time for the Wii, where when we take out the Poke Park games for their own video later, we are left with two things. Both not as large as some of the spin-offs on other consoles and devices, but both are really cool. First with Pokemon Battle Revolution, which brings us right back to the Pokemon Stadium vibes. Coming out with the fourth generation of Pokemon, this gave you the latest 3D graphical technology for Nintendo to see your Pokemon battle it out on your TV. This game was awesome. Having the ability to connect your DS to the Wii or just using the tried and true rental system. System. I also love this whole area that you're in, Pokétopia. It looks visually awesome and I'd rather go here over Super Nintendo World. No offense, I said what I said. I want to go to that park too, but I'm just saying, if I had a choice. This game really took the formula from the stadium games and expanded on it. The moves and animations are even more fleshed out, making the battles a lot more magical to experience. The game has its own Colosseum leaders to beat and eventually for you to become the champion, which is great, complete with some exclusive Pokémon to get from the game, like a Pikachu that knows Surf, a level 50 Electro and a level 50 Magmortar, plus a plethora of mystery gift items. You could also play online battling friends through Wi-Fi, which at this time was pretty exciting. No longer did you have to go to a friend's house or have to have them come over, you could still play against each other if you needed to online. But the only thing that holds this game back from being truly great, from being this ultimate successor to the Stadium franchise, is that there are no mini-games. The original Stadium games thrived because there was so much more to do outside of just the battling. That extra bit of love thrown in there. And now you have a really cool place like Poketopia with literally nothing to explore or do within. It's just disappointing. But as far as the battling aspect, the uh, main thing it needs to get right, at least it does that right and it's really cool. So yay, but I still want mini games. But for Pokemon games on the Wii, the one I remember so fondly is the one that was only on the eShop for download, the WiiWare game My Pokemon Ranch. But the reason I remember it may either be sad and you'll look at me as a monster, or you may be able to relate to it. Basically, the game acted as a storage unit for up to a thousand Pokemon connecting from the Generation 4 games, converting the 2D looks of the Pokemon into these chibi-esque smaller 3D models that explore this large open farmland where you can interact with them in various ways. All of these items would have have the Pokemon have a great time. Plus, random events could happen every 15 minutes that are pretty fun to watch and interact with, and you can unlock more fun things to do depending on what Pokemon or how many of a certain Pokemon you deposit into the game. In fact, the more you deposited, the more you unlock in the game. This game also gave you the chance to get two Pokemon. At one point where the host of the game, Haley, wants a Leafeon, you trade her one for a level 50 Fion. And later on, you can trade her a random Pokemon egg, and she'll offer you a level 50 Mew. So, not bad reward 
rewards for just using a storage unit where you can check in on and play with your Pokemon. It had a lot of details put in as well, like visually seeing the shiny Pokemon among the crowd. Now, there also was an update that was made for this game that never went outside of Japan, but it allowed for connectivity with Pokemon Platinum, where the deposit rate went up from 1,000 to 1,500 Pokemon, as well as new events and toys for all of the Pokemon, which is cool to see. But for the sad part of things here that I mentioned earlier, I haven't checked in on my Pokemon rant since the Wii was the current console from Nintendo. Once the Wii U came out, there was already years that I wasn't checking in on my Pokemon, and since it's been unplugged and stored away for over a decade, I still sit in regret every day thinking about all of the Pokemon I left on my Pokemon Ranch as they waste away into digital dust. I know I left a lot of them there, legendaries, shinies, you name it. I had a lot of fun with this game, and I never got those Pokemon back from the ranch before I would make my last visit to it, so am I a bad person, or are you in the same boat as me for that one? Let me know your moral standings in the comments below. <laughs> also, this game was even created by the team behind Hey You Pikachu, Pokemon Channel, and Pokemon Dash. And by just looking at the art style of this game, you can already see they easily went from this game to Pokemon Rumble for their next series, which again, will have its own standalone video at some point. <laughs> Only you can make Pikachu run. Now we move to the 3DS, where we see a lot more digital downloadable Pokemon games like Pokemon Battle Troze. It would really just be more of what worked in the first game, but now you can battle wild Pokemon rather than having these Troze battles against a bad guy group. You had these main 10 zones that are your challenge to get through with three stages to unlock. One of them early on can be unlocked, which is the Safari Zone, and the other two unlock after you beat the game. Now, with the game coming out in 2014, the amount of Pokemon represented here is over 700 compared to the first game's restrictions of the first three generations at the time. It's more Troze. If you want more Troze, it's here. Pokemon Art Academy is the embodiment of a relaxing game. I used to have this Pokemon set as a kid to do art. Oh wait, I have it now as an adult still. So of course, an art-based Pokemon game sounds pretty amazing. Now, Nintendo already had an Art Academy game that they made that was more generic to the every person to learn. And then they realized, wait, put some Pokemon on there and we can sell it to that audience. The main thing you do in this game is draw. If you want to test your drawing skills on the 3DS and post them on the now dead Miiverse, hey, you can do that. You will learn throughout the lessons being taught the different ways, techniques, and styles to draw Pokemon from different perspectives and more abstract ideas. There was a lot here with a wide variety of Pokemon you end up getting to draw throughout the lessons. They even had some free DLC that gave you lessons for drawing Groudon and Kyogre. Solid fun time here. Detective Pikachu really needs no introduction. This game was the perfect amount of what the heck is this? A Sherlock Holmes looking Pikachu that solves mysteries around Rhyme City with his human partner in mystery solving crime solving mystery side the Tim Goodman. It even had a full live action movie adaptation that is either a hit or miss with fans of Pokemon and fans of the game. But more importantly, it had its own jumbo sized amiibo. This is awesome. The game at first follows this Pikachu and Tim as you solve various cases around the city, helping the different Pokemon that live there, and whatever other cases come your way. A sequel to this game was announced for the Nintendo Switch all the way back in late May of 2019, but since then, nothing has come from that. And potentially the movie sequel is set to come out next summer, so maybe the game comes out before or around then as well? Or maybe by the time this video is posted, it gets announced and I look like a complete idiot? That's possible. Either way, Detective Pikachu is a really cool game and possibly deserves its own full video later on as well. Now we have a few smaller titles that were all eShop downloads on the Nintendo 3DS. First, we have Pokemon Picross, where you solve these puzzles using the numbers on the top and left side of this grid to figure out which squares on the grid to shade to uncover a Pokemon. The Pokemon you collect by doing this can also lend a hand in the gameplay to help you complete these puzzles later on. But since this is a free-to-play game, there are limitations to the game, but they mainly come in the form of microtransactions for Picrites, which you can earn a lot slower by playing the game but you can purchase great amounts of them for between a dollar and 25 bucks. This is one of the puzzle games that I think is just okay. I was not really into it as any of the other games, but it's a small little game to download to kill a few minutes of your day if you need to.
Pokemon Shuffle is a lot like the last game in terms of being a game built on microtransactions, where the base gameplay is fun enough, being closer to Puzzle League and Troze, but really aiming for the bejeweled player base. You defeat other Pokemon by pulling off some combos here, and of course doing all the matching things, but you are limited in how many moves you can do. You can buy jewels and bundles that can be exchanged for hearts to keep you playing, or for coins for some bonus help in the game. And you can also earn coins in the game as well, but at a lot slower rate. Not the worst game in the the world to do stuff like this, but certainly not the best. Pokemon Dream Radar, however, isn't like the previous two games. Here, through the power of the 3DS, you are able to use the cameras on top to mix in with the gyroscope and look around for Pokemon in augmented reality, where in this game it's called the Inter-Dream Zone, and the Pokemon you can find here can be transferred to Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. It was a fun use of the 3DS showing off the power the system had. Some other games and free software did the same, but this was Pokemon, so it gets more attention at least from me. Certain Pokemon would appear based on the Dream Orb color being used, but if you had a Generation 4 game cartridge inserted and by clicking the right buttons, you could find Dialga, Palkia, Giratina, Ho-Oh, and Lugia. Plus, you can get a chance to find these fellas here. So yeah, not a bad little AR game. Moving over to the Wii U, and technically the Switch because of the re-release, Pokken Tournament was the fighting game that Pokemon fans have been waiting for. First coming out as an arcade machine in the summer of 2015 in Japan, it would eventually be turned into a full-fledged console game where you're able to battle Pokemon in the style of a Tekken game where you directly control the Pokemon you're playing as, switching between an open area 3D space to a more 2D restricted fight during different battle phases. This game was really detailed in the way all of the different playable Pokemon were able to fight all having distinct feelings whether you were a Pikachu, a Charizard, or even a Suicune. And I am not the biggest fighting game player out there, mainly because I'm not the greatest at it, but giving me the incentive of Pokemon mixed in there, this game was a lot of fun, and I hope that one day they do make a sequel to it, with even more Pokemon to play as. Plus, this game had Shadow Mewtwo, and that was pretty awesome. And it gave you a card of Shadow Mewtwo. It wasn't a real Pokemon card, it was an Amiibo card, but, you know, close enough. So, 22 years after the original game, new Pokemon Snap would be released on the Nintendo Switch to many fans' delights, including mine. And if we're being honest, this game has the best graphics of any Pokemon game currently out there. It is so gorgeous and well-made that you just want to keep going and doing the on-rails routes to just live in this world a bit longer. Essentially, the game is just like the original in many ways, just now being a lot more fleshed out with things to do in it, giving the same routes multiple options for playthroughs that keep you coming back for different pictures of hard to photograph rare Pokemon during the day or at night, hidden areas, and even boss battles in a way to capture some truly incredible moments within this game. Now having this online feature where you can upload your photos and get ratings on them, giving you a lot more of how you wanted to view the original in your head, it just feels so cozy and relaxed that if you ever needed to just escape from it all for a few minutes, new Pokemon Snap can transport you to these beautiful areas of the Pokemon world. And if you were a kid growing up with the original and now as an adult having this one, there's so much childlike like joy that just comes from this being a real thing after joking about it for years and years hey how about a new pokemon snap game and to finally have it be a reality words cannot express how great this is and like i said earlier i got the game to work on my snap station and print out photos and for that i'm a dork but i love it Pokemon Quest is an interesting game. Similar to the Rumble series or like my Pokemon Ranch, the Pokemon here take a new look in the style of cubes. It's Pokemon Minecraft, minus the mining and the crafting part, kind of. Essentially, you have a base camp that you grow over time with items, and these items kind of like limit how much you can do within a certain amount of time. You can also get more Pokemon to join your camp over time as well. And you can select from your roster of Pokemon 3 to take into a quest to progress through the area and make your way through these dungeon-esque game play moments. I played the game originally when it came out. It's a pretty chill game with some light microtransactions that gives you a look at all the original 151 Pokemon in cubular form. They even made fake Funko Pops of these designs, so cool. I never minded this game or the look of it and wish it was kept up a bit more than it was. It was like any of those other time waster mobile games out there but with Pokemon and it won me over enough to at least care about it for a bit of time when it came out.
Pokemon Cafe Mix or Cafe Remix is another free to play game and quite possibly has the absolute cutest art style of any Pokemon spin off game ever. Every Pokemon here is so adorable and fashionable. How can you hate it? The gameplay here is matching Pokemon icons to clear the screen, but through a certain set of objectives that you have to follow. So, yeah, it's a puzzle game. It also has you collect ingredients for the different dishes that you can make at the cafe. Plus, the other Pokemon who work at your shop can help you in these challenging puzzles, giving the Pokemon themselves a nice purpose in the gameplay. Through the dishes that you end up making and serving out to the customers in your cafe, you can build friendships with them and eventually have them come aboard as staff at your cafe. Of course though, since this is a free to play game, you have the option of purchasing microtransactions to keep you playing or to be extra help in the game. I think while the free to play model in this game offers enough for different levels of casual once a day players here, a full retail price version without microtransactions that can be played more endlessly could have been the route to take for this game because it is fun and there is a lot here to do with a lot more room to grow. But how do you feel about this game specifically as I'm pretty curious if you think this would have worked really well as a standalone non-free to play game? What is there to say about Pokemon Unite? This game was hyped up so much before its release and had so many people excited for a MOBA type Pokemon game. And while I think the game is really cool, I am just not great at MOBAs. So my interest in the game went away after the week it came out. But so many of my friends heavily play this game still. And I think that's really awesome. Especially the support it has continued to get so heavily. Each team of five players versing each other has a time limit to beat the other team with the higher score through scoring points in these designated zones after defeating wild Pokemon. Pokemon on the field or opposing team Pokemon. You start off the game weak, but level up as the game goes on from experience for some pretty intense battles and moves to take over the different lanes. Now the game has a lot more to it than just that. I, I am not a MOBA expert and I'm not here to break all that down for you because I'm not the one to tell you all about that. But I will say that I do like the constant adding of new Pokemon to play as in the game, offering quite the variety here, which is honestly impressive to see where it's at right now, as well as the costumes you can purchase for your avatar character and your individual Pokemon. Pokemon themselves are really cool. I buy Fortnite skins. I can give a pass to the really cool outfits to purchase in a free to play game. But yeah, I may not play the game, but I do think for fans of MOBA games that this offers a fun experience with a Pokemon theme. Pokemon Battle Revolution. Okay, let's get weird with it now. Moving on to some classic PC titles. Let's start off with Pokemon Play It. If this image of this character has been stuck in your brain, that's okay, it has been for me as well. This game was included in the two-player CD-ROM starter set. It allowed you to learn to play the card game with the physical cards and on your computer with this program. This game is really just learning to play the game. That's it. It holds your hand to teach you the ropes as you forever get haunted by Julie there. There is nothing behind those eyes. Nothing but information on how to play Pokemon the card game. But back then, when it was the turn of the century. Aside from that, you can unlock some wallpapers from the current Pokemon card sets that were out, plus some certificates if you correctly answer some questions. Finally, who needs a degree? I am Pokemon Academy certified. Oh, you thought the nightmare was over? Well, welcome to version two of Pokemon Play It. Julie is back to teach you about Pokemon some more. This time you get the CD and the Thunderstorm gift box set, which is a really cool and nostalgic box I fondly remember so much. This acts more as a slightly updated version, hence the title, featuring some fixes that act as patches for some mechanics not working properly in version one, plus more Quiz Academy certificates. But the best feature is that now you can turn off Julie. She can't reprimand you for playing the game how you wanna play it. And from here, she was never seen again. But that doesn't mean she can't come back. Be vigilant out there. Pokemon Project Studio was a nice little creation application that allowed you to make different things like pictures, a greeting cards, stationery, postcards, and even more. There were two different versions of this, one red version and one blue version, because why not cash in on what the mainline games did as well and split up certain Pokemon and even some human characters between the two, so that's uh, neat. There is still a lot in both of the versions with 250 projects to work from, hundreds and hundreds of graphics and a very nice variety of things to create from the templates given. If you like arts and crafts as well as Pokemon, then these were the games for you.
Pokemon Masters Arena was a small little release that had eight minigames included. A matching Pokemon game, a trivia challenge, some bingo, a word jumble, Mahjong, guessing the correct Pokemon, a literal puzzle game, and a ball launching game for it to land on some rings. While it seems like some basic fun, which it is, at least you get to win a bunch of printable posters, making it all worth it, maybe. Honestly, these are the type of games that you could find on any Flash Player website back in the day. Pokemon Team Turbo could be the same thing. It's made and published by the same people as Masters Arena. But like, what exactly is it? Well, it's a racing game where you play as Pokemon that are inside of these moving Pokeballs around one of six different tracks. But in order for you to earn boosts in the race throughout its adventure mode, you have to play some mini games that correlate to these tracks that allow them. The mini games here are a crossword challenge, a guessing game, a Tetris-like game, a domino game, and a word finder. It also has one music file on loop in the game. So yeah, I guess it's more of the same here as the last game. Okay, here's something that has been locked in my brain since, well, forever. You remember these? These are Pokeroms. You gotta learn them all, or collect them all, your choice. These were educational programs that were released in the great year of 2000 that featured Professor Oak as you choose a learning level suitable for you or what grade you're in. First, you are tasked with memorizing and matching tiles, which after completing, you can view the Pokemon doing some Pokemon things. You can even print out images from the show itself, and then later you can go to the Sanctuary, where you can either go to the Observation Lab or the Trainer Center. The Trainer Center has the Trainer Race, which can be played between one and four people as you move around a board answering quiz questions, math problems, science questions, and more. And whoever can answer the most right in advance to the end first is the winner. The Observation Lab is just a way to look at images from pinging circles. But the game itself really isn't the cool part of the Pokeroms, it's actually the discs themselves. The GameCube sized discs with cut off sides would come in a variety of different styles thanks to the different Pokemon, which had three separate waves of releases by the way. First was the original release, or the Premiere series, that had ten different Pokemon on the cover of the discs from the first generation. Then they had the movie series, which had another ten discs, this time having some generation two Pokemon thanks to the Pokemon 2000 movie, and finally a a mystery series that contained 30 discs, which if you have a full collection of these, you deserve a handshake and a therapist. I only have three. So moving on from the PC, we now have something weird. Hey, what if Sega had Pokemon games? No one ever said. Well, they had three. All of them though were through this special all-in-one console laptop tablet thing called the Sega Pico. Oh, and these were all Japanese only. The first Pokemon game that came out on it was Pokemon Catch the Numbers. Featuring the voices of the anime, you have to help the crew get back their Pokemon who were stolen by Team Rocket by solving math questions. The second game, Pokemon Advanced Generation, I've Begun Hiragana and Katakana, teaches you how to read and write in Japanese through Hiragana and Katakana, while you deal with another encounter with Team Rocket. But along with this game, they released a special version of the Sega Pico, and would even come with the game bundled in with it. I mean, look at this thing. I love Pikachu Special Editions. Why don't I own this? The last game for the Sega Pico, Pokemon Advanced Generation Pico for Everyone, Pokemon Loud Battle, that's sure a title, comes with yet another cool item that I really want. It's this special controller that allows for a second player so that you can play these two player mini games, catch Pokemon and learn things. Probably. Yeah, the Sega Pico was weird, these games were weird, and oh boy, do I want to get my hands on that Pikachu Edition Pico. What about DVD-based games? Yeah, they were a thing. Here for Pokemon Champion Island, you were able to play a board game along with a DVD that would play on your TV. The game pits you and other players against one another as you answer trivia questions, collect wild Pokemon, and make your way through the game. The game itself comes with a lot of stuff. There is a special edition of the game that comes with more inside, but the original colorful box art is way cooler. And I'm not the biggest fan of DVD-based games anyway, but board games I do like, so whatever this game classifies as more is up to you, I guess. The Pokemon Mini was this little handheld device that was made just for little bite-sized Pokemon games. I mean, look at these little cartridges, it's so cute! The different games were Pokemon Party Mini, Pokemon Zany Cards, Pokemon Pinball Mini, and Pokemon Puzzle Collection. Well, those were all the games that made their way to all of the regions, including the US. Pokemon Tetris was only released in Japan and Europe, and then Pokemon Puzzle Collection Volume 2, Pokemon Race Mini, Pichu Bros Mini, Togepi's Great Adventure, and Pokemon Breeder Mini are all Japanese exclusive. Now, I did mention that you can play these, plus an exclusive new mini game for the Pokemon Channel game. So if you've never had this device or were able to play these games, then Pokemon Channel made that way more accessible for you. 
You could also get some Tamagotchi-like devices that were about the same size called Pokemon Pikachu and Pokemon Pikachu 2, with the first being in the classic colorless LCD screen and the second one being in color. They were devices for you to raise your Pikachu, minus the feeding, cleaning up after them, and nurturing that should usually be required, and essentially it acts as a pedometer to work based off your steps taken. It's like an early version of the Pokewalker, but it did have other features as well. The steps would turn into watts where you can then use it to get things for Pikachu, and in the second version, the watts can be used for mystery gift items in the second generation of Pokemon games. These devices were just really cool and iconic and honestly, a good way to promote getting a good amount of steps in throughout your day. I'm beginning to think you're not a bad player after all. <laughs> but as far as spin-off games for Pokemon Go, that's our journey here for today. Oh wait, what? What are these? Is this more Sega Pokemon games? No, no I give up. There's, there's more. Look, here, there's, there's four more. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass out. I'm gonna pass out. The other major spin-off games that were left out of today's video will all have their own standalone deep dive videos since they have quite the amount to dig into. Out of the games we did talk about, what games really stood out to you that you may remember fondly? Let me know some of your experiences down below and hey, if you want to start taking a journey through the Pokemon anime, check out my new video on my other channel as we're going through Ash's entire journey from start to finish this year. But that's all for today. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.